The song said, I want to know more about my Lord. One of the ways to know a little bit more about your Lord is Bible study on Wednesday night. Amen. The Bible will teach us a little bit more about our Lord, and we ought to continually always be students of the Word of God. Amen. So it's good to be here on Wednesday nights. Brother Tim uh, said, called a little bit earlier, said that somebody got hurt of referee in the game, so they called him in to go take care of that situation, so he ain't going to be here. But last Wednesday night, after our Esther study, he said, Preacher, I got a good title for our Wednesday night studies. He said, Wednesday nights with Esther. <laughs> That's pretty good, amen. That's pretty good, amen. Wednesday nights with Esther. So invite somebody out to Wednesday nights with Esther, amen. That's a good, amen. Thinking outside the box, amen. So Wednesday nights with Esther it is. We in chapter 2. And we'll read the chapter and we'll get into the study. We broke down the chapter into three categories. We looked at last week uh, the historical side. Or the, and we used it as a character study, studying the people of the text. Amen. Tonight we'll look at the prophetic side of chapter 2. And then next Wednesday, Lord willing, we'll look at the practical side. We call tonight under the heading of Esther replaced in Vashti. That's the title of the whole three, three series is out of this chapter. Tonight's the coming prophecies, the coming prophecies. And so when you study the Word of God, you see these coming prophecies. So let's read the chapter, Esther chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. What's the first word there? Amen. The Bible said, after these things. Now as I read my Bible, after these things, and the context here is after the things that took place where? Amen. Chapter 1, after these things. So after Vashti has been removed from the kingdom, Amen, and, they, they, uh, and she could no longer come before the king. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vash, Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. What was decreed of her against her was found in verse number 19, that she come no more before the king. He made a royal decree. The law was set by the king, and when the king made a decree and his law was set, there was no change in it. Kind of, you remember when Daniel... Amen, when he done what they said he should not do and the king, king made a, a decree with his ring and his signet and sealed that thing and then Daniel had to be thrown in the den of lions. Amen, the same kind of situation. And when the king makes a decree, it's settled. And this Gentile king, Ahasuerus, made a decree that she'd no longer come before it. And his wrath's a little bit repeased. In verse 2, the Bible said, Then the king's servants that ministered unto him, uh, excuse me, then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hegi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti, and the thing pleased the king, and he did so. In verse 5, Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, uh, the, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he sought up, um, excuse me, and he brought up Hadasha, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when he, her father and mother were dead, took for her, for his own daughter, excuse me. You see in verse number 7, he brought up Hadasha, that is her name, her Jewish name, that is Esther, which is the Persian name that was given to her while she was in captivity. You saw that over there, you, or you can see that over in the book of Daniel where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and even Daniel himself, when they were taken captive, they had their Jewish name, but when they were in captivity to the Babylons, the Babylonians give them a new name. And so it's the same thing here. I mean, if you was to ask the common person, even, you know, sometimes even ourselves, say, who was Esther? What was her Jewish name? <laughs> who would know, amen? But the Bible tells it. Had Ashi. And they gave her the name Esther. The Bible said, So it came to pass when the, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when uh, uh, many uh, maidens were gathered together in the Shushan the palace to the custody of Hegei, which is 
Hegi in verse 3, as we saw last week, that Esther was brought also into the king's house to the custody of Hegi, keeper of the women. We know it's the same person because of verse 3 that goes along with it, this same Hege and H-E-G-E is the same guys as H-E-G-A-I. He, they're both keepers of the women. They're keeping of, of the chambers, chamberlain of the women. And so this, this Esther was brought in before him as one of the women that were sought for out of the 127 provinces, these virgins that were brought before this Hege to keep the women and prepare them to go before the king. The Bible said in verse 9, And the maiden, which is Esther, pleased him, Hege, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification, which such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house, and he preferred her and her maidens unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had showed her people, had not showed her people, nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. So here's, you know, kind of get you up to date on what's going on, what we just read. It's very obvious, but, you know, just to get your mind where it needs to be is uh, in our study tonight, I have to really take in consideration that I've read this thing a lot more than you have, preparing myself for the study and without trying to throw too much on you and get above you, which wouldn't be wise. We know what's going on here. Ahasuerus has uh, rejected his wife, Vashti, after this uh, wrath appeased in his life. You know, he remembered what he had done to her, and then his servants came to him and said, Hey, Ahasuerus, there's no need in you not having a queen. You need a queen. And so they come up with a plan to get him a queen that's to seek out over the 127 provinces that he ruled over, that over 2,000 plus square mile territory that he reigned over of the Medes and the Persians. And he said, they said, hey, we'll bring in these young virgins out of all the provinces and we'll bring them before you and whichever one of these fair virgins pleases you, she can be the king. And so they brought in all these women. It doesn't say the amount that they brought in, but over 127 provinces, a vast area. There's no telling how many women were brought in, kind of like what you would know, uh, call a beauty pageant. So these women would come in, and they would stand in this he guy, this keeper of the women's house, and he would prepare them to go before the king. And so now Esther is one of the women in over the 127 provinces, Mordecai being her uncle, which is actually her cousin. Amen. He kind of raises her like his uncle, you know, like her uncle. They were kin. After uh, uh, Esther's family, we don't know when, died. They're not no longer mentioned. They're dead here. That he took her in as an orphan and adopted her as his own child, and she looked at him as a father. And so she, and Mordecai says, uh, Esther can go in before the king, and the, the ultimate picture is of the book of Esther that she can save the Jewish people from what's going to come their way. And Mordecai puts Esther in the place to go in before the king. But he says, don't tell them where you're from. Because they find out you're a Jew, it's probably going to be bad because the Jews have always had a history of being hated by all nations. And so she's keeping it secret. And Mordecai, every day, according to verse 11, would walk up and check on her to see how she was going. He took care of her. Now, verse 12, and when every maid's turn was come to go in to the king of Hazarus, after that she had been 12 months, uh, according to the manner of women, so, for so were the days of her, their purification accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of mirth, and six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. There were 12 months of purification, uh, six months with oil and mirth, and six months of sweet odors before the woman could ever go in before the king, whoever the woman was. It shows that, uh, I guess, they stunk. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a joke. Verse 13. But it didn't need to smell right and be clean before they went before the king. Verse 13. Uh, and then thus came, air and by the way, it doesn't go do anybody wrong to take a bath and clean yourself up. Good quality practices that we all ought to try to do to, you know, be presentable in this old world. Amen. Verse 13. Uh, then thus came every maiden unto the king, whosoever she desired, uh, excuse me, whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. Now who's over the women's house that would give her what she needs? Higi, right? And so whatever was needed by her, he would give these women before they went in. The Bible said in verse 14, in the evening she went 
And on the morrow she returned, whoever the woman was, unto the second house of the women, to the custody of uh, Sheaskaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except kings, the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. So once these women would go in before the king, spend that night with him, when they came back, they became his concubines. You see that practice in the Old Testament a lot, where a person would have wives and concubines. In some places, they would have many wives and many concubines. And that's not the practice that it is to be done in the New Testament today, but it was an Old Testament practice, amen, and how, how this thing took place. And so when that woman would go in before the king, if she wasn't going to be the queen, she'd become one of his concubines. The Bible said in verse 15, now when the, when the turn of Esther, when, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what he gave, uh, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus, and to the house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her and made her queen instead of Vashti. She won the beauty contest. She's crowned king, queen of the beauty contest and becomes the king's queen. Verse 18, then the king made it a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. That's what he called it. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. And Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as she was brought up with him. Just as he had always said, don't let them know you're a Jew, don't let it be known, she has kept it a secret. Verse 21, in those days, the days that she was made queen, after this had taken place, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, shows you his position in the kingdom over there, uh, and uh, rule, as we said last week, as we've studied also in the book of Ruth in the past, that the gate was a place where transactions would take place. Mordecai was some kind of high official, even though he was a captive Jew uh, to the Medes and Persians, just like Esther was. He, God had showed favor in his life and put him at the king's gate where he had responsibilities. I mean, God has showed favor to you in this world, which is not our home. We're just pilgrims passing through and give us responsibilities in the world. And so he said at the king's gate, the Bible said, as he sat there, two of the king's chamberlains, Big Than and Teresh, of those which kept the door, so these guys worked also at the door of the king's house, were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai. Mordecai heard about these two guys, this Big Than and Teresh, how they wanted to uh, lay hands on the king. And Mordecai, the Bible said in verse 22, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king, therefore in Mordecai's name. So she went in and said, hey, Mordecai's let me know, the guy that keeps your gate, that Big Than and Teresh, these two guys, are wanting to kill you. And the Bible says in verse 23, and that's a very important passage later on you'll see, and when inquisition was made, they inquired in the matter. Made of the matter, it was found out. So what Mordecai said was true. Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. They killed both of those guys, and they wrote down what happened that day, what, Esther, what Mordecai had uh, told Esther, which Esther told the king in the book of the Chronicles. Amen. So let's pray tonight. Ask God's blessings. That was a little bit lengthy reading, but this gives us a little bit of history of what's going on in that chapter. Luke, how about pray for us? Dear Lord, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for all you've done for us. Pray that you watch over this preacher tonight. Pray that you give him the words to speak. Pray that you help him remember what he said. We pray that you help us to open our minds and not accept what you have us to get out of this tonight. If there's anybody here lost that surely needs salvation, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We kind of used the chart a little bit tonight. I don't know if much you can see back there far. But we've used it in the past to show the history of the books from Chronicles all the way up to the book of Job, even the book of Psalms, how it shows a premillennial, pre-tribulation, pre-rapture truth. Uh, but we also see as we study the book of Esther, which the Jewish bride replaces the Gentile bride when the church is raptured out, the Gentile bride being 
Vashti, the Jewish bride being Esther, and she's grafted back in Romans 11. We'll see some of that tonight. And we're looking at the prophetic picture of something that's taking place in the very future. And so if you look down this map from Genesis to Revelation, you see these books that took place in the Old Testament, which are pictures and types of what took place in the New Testament. That's called prophecy, where something in the Old is said before it ever happened, what will eventually happen. Just as you study in the Bible a lot, there's prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ coming to this world, born of a virgin. Isaiah 53, him being slain, being crucified on the cross of Calvary. After the crucifixion of the Lord 2,000 years ago, we've been living in what's called the church age, where God's been saving whosoever will, Jew or Gentile, all that would receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, placed into the body of Christ, which is a type of the Gentile bride, which will be raptured out soon. The next event on the calendar for you and I is for God to step out of the cloud and call the children of God home. First Thessalonians chapter number four. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And what's it mean the dead in Christ? Is that soul sleep? No, don't get messed up with soul sleep. Once a person dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But their body goes back to the dirt. They got a temporal celestial body according to 1 Corinthians 15. Why? they're in heaven right now. The saints of God that have gone on before you and I are in heaven with God. Now those that were not saved, they're in hell tonight. Yeah. But God said they're up in heaven and the Lord's going to come back and the dead in Christ going to rise first. Their bodies, their old bodies, is going to be resurrected to meet their soul in heaven and we going to be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the rapture of the church. I know the word rapture is not a Bible word, but the truth of the word and what it means, the snatching away, the come up hither, the calling away, is a biblical truth. So don't let people disturb you about the rapture because you cannot find the word rapture when it's obvious that God calls his children home. And he calls them home before what's called the seven-year tribulation period. It's all called, called the Jacob's trouble. The reason why it's called Jacob's trouble because Jacob is Israel. And Israel is the Jews, right? So you get those words, Jacob's trouble. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which is Israel, the tribes of Israel, which is God's going to grab back in. That's Daniel's 70th week of prophecy when God uh, takes the church away and then puts that 70 years of prophecy that he prophesied in Daniel about the future of this. That 70 years of prophecy, 490 years, there's 70 weeks, not 70 years. 70 weeks, which every week represents seven years, which is 490 years, was a prophecy prophecy about God's people. And if you study that prophecy, uh, 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 the Messiah, the prince, was cut off, but not for just his people. He was cut off for all, right? And so that 70th week of prophecy when all uh, uh, destruction is put away. Boy, that's loud, ain't it, amen? It's going to be put away. It's like I'm, you know, speaking from heaven. <laughs> it gets the sound effects for the rapture and tribulation. <laughs> Prophetic, you know? So there's a seven-year tribulation. And that's set down your 70th week of prophecy. The Jacob's trouble. Amen. And then after Jacob's trouble, there'll be a, a rapture of the tribulation saints. The Lord will come back. We'll come back with him. There'll be battles that take place on earth. Then there'll be a thousand-year millennial reign. Amen. Which is all prophetic future events and then an eternity with God, which is revelation and you begin to look at eternity and things that will be way beyond eons of time that begin to blow our minds that cannot comprehend that much truth. But one day I shall see. Amen. There's some things not even entered in the heart of man that we'll lay eyes on one day. So I said all that to say that when we come to chapter 2 here, we're talking about tonight the coming prophecies of Esther chapter number 2. As we studied this chapter last week, we saw the historical truths that we can learn out of our Bible, and I'll just kind of go over it again. You can't hear it enough. We're looking at the three applications of Scripture as we've studied in the book of Esther thus far, the historical view, what happened historically in that context, the prophetic, what's going to happen in the future that I can learn out of that text, and then, of course, how does that text speak to my heart? What can I learn? So the coming prophecies of chapter 2. When it comes to prophecies, and the word prophecy is, by definition is just a foretelling a prediction, a declaration of something to come. That's prophecy. A prediction, something's going to come. And man, when you read the Bible, amen, it's amazing how much of this book is still yet to be fulfilled. It's living King James 1611 Bible, which is quick and powerful. It's alive. That's where you get the word quicken, amen. Alive, not fast, but alive. But it is fast. It's quick and fast, amen. It's alive. It can get to where it needs to be quickly, can't it, amen. But it's amazing how much of this book is still yet to come to pass. 
As we read this book and look about what happened in the past and we look about what God's doing today, there's still multitudes of things that's yet to happen in the future, the rapture, tribulation, millennial, and the eternity, amen, that's still yet to be fulfilled in this book. And God's gonna use this same book through eternity, amen, that's given us to fulfill the things that he has foretold. Amen. amen, and thank God not only has he prophesied it, it will come to pass. What we have in these prophecies in chapter two is like we had in chapter one, amen. You have things that are going on on earth, tribulation, while you have things that are going on in heaven where the church has been raptured out, and during that seven-year tribulation period, what's going on with Jacob's trouble and those that are left behind, kind of, you know, the, those left behind series kind of weaken that theme down a little bit, but they're going to be left behind. People that are not saved, they're not going home to glory. Amen. And some of them is going to be, uh, receive, uh, believe strong delusions and believe a lie and be damned because they rejected the love of the truth. People say, well, I'll wait till I get in a tribulation. You better be careful waiting to get in a tribulation if God's already revealed some things to you in the light. He'll blind you in the tribulation. Amen. But while there's seven years of tribulation, and, it, and this right here could start tonight. Amen. God could take us home tonight in the rapture. Amen. And as you look at the events that are going on on earth, there'll be seven years of things that are going on in heaven. And as you study the book of Esther, we saw in chapter one that Vashti is removed, amen, and she's removed and God begins to talk about a banquet that's going on in heaven, which is the type of the prophecies of that chapter, while there's hell going on on earth. And when you come to chapter two, you see the same events kind of. Not as much as chapter one, but you'll see more events that's taking place on earth in chapter two than you'll say that's going on in heaven, but you will see things that are going on in heaven. So let's look at some prophecies of chapter two with that in mind. Number one, I want you to call your attention to verses one and two. Verse one and two. We're talking about coming prophecies. When I read this book and I read about what this king did with this wife and what took place with his friends, God has got something entwined within that scripture that speaks way about something in the future. And by the way, when you read your Bible, there'll be a lot, of, like this book of Psalms is loaded with it. And you'll see David that wrote a lot of Psalms, the sweet psalmist David. And David wrote a lot about the Psalms. And he wrote about things that took place in his life. And when you're reading, you're reading about how he run from Saul and the struggles that he faced in life. And he's writing about that. And he's writing about what he knows went on. But the Holy Ghost of God is on him writing. And while he's writing about what went on in his life, a lot of times he don't even have a clue that he's speaking about something in the future that the Holy Ghost has allowed him to say to help somebody later. That's what's amazing about the Word of God. God to use these authors to write these books and pen them down by, the, of course, the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And the, dealing with prophecy, by the way, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, 19, 17, 18, 19, 21, somewhere down in there. And this prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost of God. Inspiration is God breathed. They spoke it. Let me say, we got the original autographs. Man, the original autographs are spoken words, not written words. Chew on that a little while, amen. They were spoken. God used man to pen it to preserve the word of God. And we've got it in King James English today. And it is God's breathed, inspired, preserved words. But the prophecy came. And prophecy has a meaning. Let me just, can I read you this before we get, look in Revelation. Hold your place right here. Just read Revelation chapter one. Revelation one. We're talking about prophecy. Let me just read you this. Pretty interesting when you think about prophecy tonight. Revelation chapter 1, look in verse number 3. And you know the revelation, the book of Revelation, is the revelation of future events, right? John was on the Isle of Patmos, and God showed him these events by revealing them to them, revelations to him. Thus the word revelation. And the Bible said in verse 3 of chapter, verse 3 of chapter 1, blessed is he that readeth, right? And they that hear the words of this, what? Prophecy. And keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. And John writing, he says, by this place, you are blessed is the man that reads them and keeps these prophecies. They're prophecies that you're reading mainly about the tribulation in the book of Revelation. There's a little bit about the church in the beginning, but after chapter 4, you see them in heaven and no more mention till they come back. And then the tribulation is what's dealing with on earth, which is Esther and Vashti. Vashti, the Gentile bride that's raptured out. Esther, the Je uh, Jewish bride that's grafted back in. And we'll look a, bit, a little bit more about that in a minute. Look at the end of the book, Revelation chapter number uh, 22. The end of the whole Bible itself. 
You don't think God's concerned with prophecy? Look what he says. In Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19, the two verses next to the last two verses of your whole Bible, he said, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. And that book being this book could be revelation taken from the prophecy of this book. It's a dangerous thing to mess with the prophecy of this book. But if you look at the book itself, this book is dangerous to take away from the prophecy. Whether you take it away from, from the, this book, Revelation, or this book, the whole Revelation of 66 books, you better not mess with God's book. Amen. Amen. God's prophesied them for us, for our admonition and learning. Now, back to Esther chapter number 2. First of all, I see in the coming prophecies of chapter 2, Vashti, the Gentile bride, is in heaven while virgins are sought for. Now, we know Vashti is not in heaven. Vashti, historically, was just removed from being his queen, right? But we're talking about how, what does this show us prophetically? If Vashti is a type of the Gentiles in the church age that are raptured out, right? So Vashti is gone. She's, she, by type, type, don't, be, don't get disturbed by words of type. That's just a, a type, an illustration of something, right? So it's Vashti. She's, she's a type of the church that is raptured out. She's, by the way, a Gentile, which is amazing because the church is, I know, Jew and Gentile, right? We know that. God saves whosoever will. But primarily in this age, he's dealing with what? The Gentiles. So that makes a vast eye great type of the raptured church. Now, she's been removed. She's no longer his queen. She's taken out of place. And then they're seeking for somebody to take her place while she's gone. In type, she's gone to heaven. The church is out of here. Now God's trying to uh, find a bride for Ahasuerus. Look in verse 1. After these things, when the, king's wrath, uh, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what he had done and what was decreed against her. Then said, and by the way, you used to make a lot more sense the more we look at this thing. You say, well, he just ran her off. What, he, what was done to her? Why did he do it to her? You know why he done it to her? Because she was wrong. She didn't obey his command. About, you know, when we get a little bit later on tonight, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but you just throw it out there a little bit. When we start looking at Vashti being removed, which is the type of Romans chapter number 11, the Gentiles being cut off. You know why the Gentiles are cut off? You know why God raptures out the church? Not because the bride's full, and that's how I'm full with the bride, and I'm going to go back to the Jews. God shows you in the book of Revelation, he gets rid of the Gentiles because the Gentiles go into apostasy and rebel against God. The same reason why he cut off the Jews and started the church age because the Jews rejected God. You see that thing played out in your Bible. They rejected God the Father in the Old Testament, God the Son when he showed up, and God the Holy Ghost showed up and they rejected him, and God started the church. You know what the church is going to do? We're going to get high-minded, we're going to go into apostasy, and God's going to say, I'm about to take them home and I'm done with them, then I'll go get me another bride. Same thing that the God done to the Jews, he's going to do to the Gentiles, and he done it to the Jews because Jews reject, and he's going to do it to the Gentiles because the Gentiles are rejected. We live in a world of people rejecting God today. And what you'll find out, whatever the, whatever the dispensation is in the, in the Bible, whether it be when God had a man in the garden or when he had a man under, the, under his conscience or under Noah or a man, a man under the law of Moses or when the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, hey, literally here is the king, surely they'll receive him. You know what you find out in every dispensation? Man ends in apostasy. He rejects God and falls on his face. And God says, you know what he does? He's merciful and tries again. You know what God could do? God could blow the whole earth away and be done with all of us. He'd be glad he's merciful. He's not only merciful to Adam in the garden and to Noah on the boat, amen. He's not merciful to Moses and those under the law. God's merciful to you and I too. I wonder how much sick he is of us. And I say the word sick, Laodicea and age, which is a type of the age we're in where there's neither hot nor warm, and God said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Vashti rebelled. And the king remembered. And so what did they decide to do? Verse 2, Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young, fair young virgins sought for the king. So Vashti, the Gentile bride, is in heaven while the virgins are sought for. 
Here's, here's a few things just to keep in mind. He said they're seeking for virgins. We said this is what's taking place on earth, right? In the tribulation period. He said virgins. That's what a plural. That's an S. When you talk about the church, Vashti, she was just one lady. You'll say, well, Esther's going to be one lady eventually. Yeah, but he's seeking for virgins. We're talking about prophecy in chapter 2. Vashti, singular, one lady. You know what the church is? The church is not plural. The church is singular. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, you can write the ver re reference down that God said he, he, he espoused us as a chaste, virgin to Christ. And he's talking about the church, born again believers from, from the cross up to this present hour. God, it's made up of many members, but it's one body. The body of Christ is one. And when you talk about the church age, you're talking about a collection of all individuals and God describes them as a chaste virgin, singular, but now they're seeking for virgins, which is important when you read your Bible and I'll show you some scriptures why, how a lot of people get messed up today with trying to put the church with the Jews and the Jews with the church. Yeah. You mess your Bible up like that. Amen. You better find out why something's going on on earth. There's things going on in heaven. Yeah. And while God's dealing with the Jews sometimes, he's not necessarily messing with the Gentiles. And when he's messing with the Gentiles, you better be careful trying to apply the Jewish truths to your life, yeah. which a lot of people do. So there's bride of Christ. There's, there's, she's spoken of in the singular. These are virgins. They sought for young virgins in verse number two. Virg he, he, he said virgins in verse 2. He said virgins, I said with an S in verse 3, in verse 17 and verse 19. These virgins are Jews in the tribulation period that, that has works, by the way, connected with their salvation. That's why it's important to see this thing, how it plays out, what's going on in the tribulation and what's going on in heaven. But there is no works associated with you being saved today. You know what a lot of people tell you today? You got to do this and you got to do this and you can't do that. And they try to put you under bondage and works to be saved. Yep. We know clearly that salvation is by the grace of God. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's no works connected with you being saved. But when a man gets into tribulation period, he not only got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says keep the commandments. And if he takes the mark of the beast, he goes back away from that truth. He sealed himself to the doom of, of, of a, a devil's hell. Yeah. You can't go back from it today. But when you talk about these virgins of the tribulation, you're talking about something connected with works and salvation. Yeah, That's why a lot of people try to put you under works in the church age because they can't show you the difference between somebody in the tribulation getting saved or somebody in the law getting saved, which is different than somebody getting saved in the church age. Yeah. Obvious, nobody saved the same one under the law of Moses or they saved under, uh, under grace today because there is nobody to believe on. There's no death. You say, well, Isaiah 53 prophesies about the death. Yeah, but it was blind. It is Israel still don't know it was him. They didn't know it was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, Israel still blind to today. They think it's talking about them. And it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, which you can see today because the blinders are off you. But they couldn't see it. Hey, the apostles that walked with the Lord Jesus Christ did not see the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection. Peter said, God forbid you go die. Man, his death is why we're saved. And when, he, and when he resurrected from the dead, they thought it was idle tales. Luke says in Luke 24. And they kind of thinking, man, well, why is it an idle tale? Listen to me. Why? is the resurrection of the Lord to one of his disciples an idle tale if that disciple, while Jesus Christ was alive, was preaching the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection that you preach today. You know why it was an idle tale to them? Because they weren't preaching the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection. They were preaching a gospel of a kingdom that the king of the Jews, Jesus, which is the king of the Jews, was here, and you can have your physical kingdom of heaven kingdom. And they missed it. And by the way, that's why there's a kingdom of heaven and a kingdom of God. And heaven is what? A physical place where we're going to. God is a spirit, and they which worship him must worship him in spirit and in what? Truth. So the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. Men take it by force, the Bible says, and the kingdom of God is spiritual. Luke said it's within you. It's the new birth. Amen. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. That's physical but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's spiritual. So there's something different going on here. So you got these virgins. 
And he's talking about these virgins over here that they're seeking for, prophetically speaking about, let's go get the king, Ahasuerus, virgin sought for of all the kingdoms. Who are these virgins? Look in Matthew 25. Hold your place in Esther, Matthew 25. Y'all going to have to listen quicker. Amen. We're losing all our time up on the first point. Matthew 25. Everybody with me? Don't get, if it, some of it goes over your head, amen, go back. Hey, we, we on Facebook Live. Go watch it again. Yeah. By the way, Brother Richie's putting them on YouTube now too, so you can get it there too if you don't like Facebook. Spread the word. Tell somebody to like us on Facebook, amen. You can become a YouTube member, by the way, and that will help you to be able to hear some truth or spread some truth to other people. That's what it's for, amen. It's about putting the truth out to the world. If technology the, the, that the Lord has given this world, and I know a lot of people are using it in a wicked way, we're trying to use it in a right way. Amen. amen. You can use things the right way. Amen. And uh, that YouTube could be a blessing to others where a lot of people have made it a destruction in their lives. It's all about what you do with it. Amen. Not like anything else. A woman... A woman in your life can be a blessed thing. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. But you can do it the wrong way and that woman be a bad thing in your life. So it's all about what you do with what God's given you. Just an illustration. Matthew 25. What is Matthew 25 talking about? When you look at Matthew 25, you'll see these virgins that are mentioned. I'll read the text. You'll see the virgins. You'll see these virgins and their, their, their works that are connected with them going home to be with God. Why is it talking about works being connected with these virgins? Because we're talking about the tribulation. We're talking about salvation that's different than the church age. That's why a lot of people will take you to Matthew 25 and say those virgins are talking about you and you've got to keep your lamp burning. If the light goes out, you die without Jesus Christ. When Matthew 25 is not talking about you because the church is not virgins, the church is a chaste virgin. So little S's mean a whole lot of doctrine in your Bible. Well, people to take one little letter and destroy their own lives and what they teach. Well, let somebody bewitch you with some doctrine that's not so. That's why a lot of people in the Bible tells about the book of Ephesians are carried about with every wind of doctrine. People can take anything out of the Word of God and throw it in your face, and if you don't know how to put it in its right place, the way God wrote it, because everything in that book's not directly talking about your life. Amen. But everything in that book, I can learn something from it. But don't be careful. Let somebody put you under a, a false doctrine, which the Bible calls doctrines of devils that are not for you today. Amen. There's a lot of things in this book that's not for you today. Amen. A lot of it. Prime example would be God commanded Noah to go out there and build an ark. That's a commandment in the Word of God, but it wasn't for you. Amen. You ain't building no ark in your backyard. If you are, I don't know. Maybe we need to check you out. I don't know. But it's a Bible commandment. He was supposed to go do it. So don't say, well, you know, we, we, we say the words, we sing the songs, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse is mine. Every bit of it's you and it's for you and you can learn something from it, but everything in there is not directly, written directly for you as a command. Yeah. So don't let somebody bewitch you when you're talking about a King James Bible that covers history from in the beginning to amen when God's done, which covers the history of how God dealt with man all through ages and stuff that's going to take place when we ain't even here that the book's speaking about. So there's things in there that's not written directly for your life. I think somebody says about like going out of the mailbox and grabbing somebody else's mail and trying to play their bills. That don't work, man. I don't want to pay nobody else's bills. You know, half the time we don't even want to pay our own. Well, let's correct that. We ought to because that's a good Christian testimony. Pay your bills. Matthew 25, now look, verse 1. The Bible said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven, there's a key. Remember what we said, heaven was its physical. It's a millennial kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, and then shall the, king, uh, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, plural, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The Bible said five of them were wise, five were foolish. And the Bible said, all of them's virgins, the pure and clean. They're going to meet the bridegroom, and some of them are wise, some are foolish. Verse 3, they that were foolish took their lamps and no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil. For our lamps are gone out. 
But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You know what they tell them? Go get your own. Go work for it and earn it. I'm not giving you mine. I, I might lose mine if I share it with you. Well, that is not New Testament salvation. What I got is enough for me and the whole world if they want it. When I receive the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not only can save my soul, but it can save the souls of all mankind in the world. And if you want it, you just believe God will save you. That's not what's being taught here. And that's why a lot of people say what we teach today in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ being the only thing is not sufficient because this don't teach it to be sufficient. But as a Bible student, you understand he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and he's talking about virgins, not virgins, the, the, the singular church. He's talking about the Jewish tribulation and them getting ready because the bridegroom's coming. The Bible said in verse 10, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they, were, and, and they that were ready went in with him to the, guess where they went? They went to a marriage. That's key, remember that. And the door was shut after came also other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. These virgins. These virgins are the types of those virgins that were sinking out over the whole province. It's talking about the tribulation period. Amen. You see these virgins, uh, the, or, or, uh, their works are connected with their salvation. You'll see that, look back in Esther chapter number uh, 2. Look at this right here. You'll see that in Esther chapter number 2 that the virgins are gathered together twice. They sought out fair young virgins over the whole province, remember? Verses 2 and 3, and they brought them in before the king. They come in. They bring these virgins in and they purify them and get them ready to go before the king, right? It's obvious they brought them all in one time. Now look in verse number, uh, look in verse number 19. The Bible said, this is after verse 18, Esther's made queen. The crown's laid on her head in verse 17. They made a feast and gave gifts in verse 18. Verse 19, and when the virgins were gathered together, what? Second time. When Mordecai said at the king's gate. In the book of Esther in chapter 2, the virgins are sought for to all come before the king in that beauty pageant. But at the end, he marries Esther. And after Esther is married, by the way, there's that marriage that virgins are gathered up to that marriage. You know what the virgins in Matthew 25 is? It's a type of the Jewish tribulation going up to the marriage that takes place right at the end of the seven years in heaven before the church comes back with Jesus Christ. He brings them up. So here they are. They gathered the second time. The virgins are gathered. When are they gathered? They gathered after the queen has put on her crown and they're having a banquet. They're there for it. What is that talking about? That's talking about the end of the tribulation period because it's after the seven-year reign, by the way, of the king when he makes her queen. Seven years, again, it all works with the tribulation period. At the end of that seven years, she's married. Amen. She comes up to the wedding. These virgins come. Amen. Ain't it amazing? Look at this. You, what you'll find out that in Revelation chapter number seven, you can write it down, we won't look at all. In Revelation chapter number seven, you'll see what the Bible talks about the 144,000. Have you ever heard that number before? Amen. The Jehovah lie witnesses <laughs> believed that was them. And then when they found out, they used to be called Russellites after Charles Taz Russell, by the way, and then they changed their name to Jehovah Witnesses. They ain't witnessing for no Jehovah in this book. Amen. And maybe some of them's your friends, but they're wrong and they're in error and they, they believe in a lie. Their, their doctrine was the 144,000 were the Jehovah Witnesses. And then they got to being too many people that had to change their doctrine. That's how it usually works, you know. We didn't think we'd get this big. Now it got this big. Now that don't work. Don't fit our doctrine. We change our doctrine. Ain't that amazing? Those 144,000, by the way, are not Jehovah's Witnesses. They ain't you. They ain't me. By the way, those 144,000 come 12,000 from, per, from uh, 12 tribes. 12 times 12 is 144,000. They come from the 12 tribes of Israel. And by the way, if you read it in Revelation chapter number 7, they are all virgins. Well, ain't that amazing? How many Jehovah Witnesses that claim themselves to be the 144,000 you know as virgins? See, it don't never make sense when you read a Bible and what they believe. But you know what the problem is? People don't read their Bible. So there's 144,000 virgins 
Uh, 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 that, that are, th this is the tribulation period. And in Revelation chapter number 7, the first time you see that 144,000, you know where you see them at? You see them on earth. And they're going around and preaching. And they're testifying for the Lord. In Revelation chapter number 14, you know where you find these 144,000? You see them in heaven. In Revelation 14, ain't amazing? The second time they're mentioned. Just like Esther chapter number 2, they gathered together the first time. Then the second time they gathered out of marriage. They come to that marriage. And that marriage is taking place in heaven. And there's the end of the seven years of the king's reign and now they came up before them. Amen. Uh, you know what these virgins are? Uh, they're, they're invited to the marriage of the Lamb. Revelation 17 in the end, it takes place at the end of the tribulation period in heaven. Events going on there while events are going on here. You get it? They come up to the wedding. You know what these virgins are called? They're called companions to the bride. You'll find that in uh, Psalms chapter 45. Read Psalms chapter number 45. What a great picture of that marriage taking place in heaven. And you'll find those virgins in Psalms 45 in verse number 14, which is talking about the Jews that come up at the end of the tribulation period. There's the prophecy. The Gentile bride. Amen. Look in verse number 6. The Bible said, who were, the, the Bible said they called them in. They got these virgins in. Mordecai is taking his place in verse 5. He shows up on the scene. And Mordecai, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away by Jeconiah, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he's talking about this Mordecai, this Jew. And this Jew is over here in the book of Esther that is a, a captive Jew. He's been taken captive. You say, what's the importance of that word? That word's a big word in your Bible when you talk about prophecy. Because captivity, speaking about the term that God uses to show the bondage of the Jews in the tribulation period. Job 24, the end of the book of Job, verse 10. Job, you remember Job? Job, there's 24 chapters, or the, like the 24 months, three and a half years of the great tribulation period. Job's a type of the Jew in the tribulation period, remember? And Job's over there, and the Bible says at the end of Job, the end of Job, the end of the tribulation period, the end of the 72 weeks, uh, the 42 weeks, the end of the, the last three and a half years of the great tribulation period. The Bible says in Job 42.10, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. What's the captivity of Job? Job had lost his family. He had lost his wealth, right? He had lost all his uh, health. And this shows the type of the Jews in the tribulation because they won't take the mark of the beast. They can't buy, sell, or trade. Right? They're poor. They're running for their lives. They're being afflicted by everybody around them. But in the end, God turns the captivity of Job. He delivers that Jew into the tribulation at the end. He raptures them out. That's the captivity being turned. And it says that Mordecai came under captivity, showing us where the setting of this chapter is taking place. You find that word all through the Old Testament. The captivity speaks about God's people, and God turns them away from it. Now look in verse number 12. We're talking about prophecies of chapter 2. It's showing what's going on on earth while something's going on in heaven. Verse 12. The Bible said, Now when every maid's turn was come to go before King Ahasuerus, after she had been 12 months. Now what happens? It's time for the, queens, the, the, the virgins to go before the queen, king. And there's 12 months of purification. You know why they need to be purified? Because they're unclean. You know why? You know what? By the way, we all are unclean. But you know, there's a little prophet, you know, this might be stretching a little bit with prophecy-wise, but it is something that takes place in the future, and it's just something I wanted to throw out and add in there with this purification here because of what people believe. You know, you know there's, there's the, there was the coming prophecies by this time of the Lord Jesus Christ coming, and he would be born of a virgin, and that virgin was Mary, right? You, you know what Mary had to do after she birthed the Lord Jesus Christ? In Luke chapter number 2 and verse 21 through 24, which is a type of the law in Leviticus 12, she had to offer up a sacrifice for her purification after the birth of the Lord. You say, what's the big deal with that? Well, it ain't a big deal to you, probably not many big deal for many people around our area, but it's a big deal for people that are Catholics. You know what a Catholic believes? That Mary is a perpetual virgin. She never had sin, and she's the one you pray, Hail Mary, Mother of God, to have your sins forgiven, and you count your rosary beads for Mary to go to heaven. 
You know what the Bible teaches about Mary? She's just like Esther here, that Jewish woman there. She needed to be purified because she was unclean. And after the birth of the Lord, Mary had to be purified because she was unclean. She was a virgin, a great lady that God used, but she's not the Mary that the Catholics worship, amen, is some perpetual virgin that never had any more children, which ain't biblical, amen. And she had to be purified because Mary can't forgive anybody's sins. Amen. Mary can't save nobody. Amen. Especially, they, they ain't even believe in the Mary of the book. But even the Mary of this Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ's mother can't save nobody. She's just a good lady that God used. Amen. She had to be purified too. Nobody can save but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. She didn't even need a purifying. Now look in verse 16. The Bible says, so Esther, you there? Are we going too much? Can we finish? You're not going to say yeah or nay, are you? Just gonna say, we'd be all right if you leave, preacher, and we'd be all right if you don't, because we ain't going to tell you, but we're really thinking you're just going too long. Bear with me just a little bit. Let me finish. Verse 16, I'll be quick. So Esther was taken unto the king, Ahasuerus, under the house royal in the 10th month. Remember last week when historically teaching, we were teaching the months of the Bible. The 10th month is the book month of December. December, Deca, 10, right? October, Octa, 8. October is actually the 8th, November 9th, December 10th, Jewish calendar, January is the first month, uh, uh, the, the 11th month, and then February is the 12th month, and then March is the first month on the Jewish calendar, which goes with Passover. Jesus Christ being our Passover, he's the beginning of all things. So, you know, don't get messed up with your thinking on Americanism. I mean, it's amazing if you even look at the words uh, through, the, through the months themselves, how Deca is 10, December, we make it 12. November 9, October 8, you know, and we make it 10. It just don't even work. But anyhow, don't get confused. When you study months in the Bible, that month T-bar, the 10th month, is the month of December in our age. This is when it took place, the 10th month, that she's made queen. And the Bible says in verse number 17, he put the crown on her. Amen. Uh, the Bible said that uh, he, she, the royal crown was upon her head and she was made queen instead of Vashti. Verse 18, then the king made a great feast unto all the provinces. When? During that 12th, that, that 10th month, that month of December. And even Esther's feast, they made great release to the provinces and they gave gifts according to the state of the king. And the virgins are there. Amen. What's taking place over here? During the 10th month of December, the seventh year of the reign of Ahasuerus, Amen, he, 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 he is married to uh, Vashti, uh, Esther, excuse me. Uh, and during that time, they have missed Esther's feast and they begin to give gifts. And we're talking about prophecy. What's these gifts all about during that time? During the end of the seven-year tribulation period where she's married. Look in Revelation chapter 11. Look quick, Revelation 11. Revelation 11. They're giving gifts. You know, you know when they're giving gifts over there in the book of Revelation? During the end of that thing, in Revelation chapter number, by the way, if you study the book of Revelation, you say chapter 11, that's not the end of the book of Revelation. And it's not. The end of the book of Revelation is chapter 22. Yeah. But if you remember when we studied the book of Revelation, if you sit down and read the book of Revelation, you'll find out that the book of Revelation is just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are four accounts. In the book of Revelation, you have four accounts of the tribulation. And they're shown through different lenses, like Matthew wrote about the Lord through the lens of his eye, and Luke did, and John, right? That was the lens. The book of Revelation, John wrote through the lens of vows and tribulations that God used. And, and that's why you see uh, uh, four different times God taking people home. He don't take them home but one time at the end of the tribulation period. But why would he do it four different times? Because when you read the book of Revelation, he's given four accounts of the tribulation, lap, 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 lap. Might be too much, but that's what's happening there. So in Revelation chapter number 11, you're at the end of the tribulation period in one of the first scenes. By, you, you don't know how? Look in Revelation 11, verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. And they ascended in, up into heaven in the clouds, and their enemies beheld them. What's that? God rapturing them out. That's in chapter 11. There's a whole, there's a whole lot more tribulation to go on because that's one of the events of the tribulation period. Matter of fact, it's actually the, the, the third event. Uh, well, second event, excuse me, of to the book of Tre uh, uh, Revelation. Now look in verse number, uh, we're talking about giving gifts. Verse 7. The Bible said in verse 7, And when they shall have finished their testimony, there's two prophets out there witnessing for the Lord. And by prophecy, if you study them, they're Moses and Elijah showing up in the old, in, in tribulation period, God resurrected them to go preach. 
And the Bible said they're down there preaching, look. And the Bible said when they finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies of Moses and Elijah shall lie in the street of the great city, which is called uh, Sodom and Egypt. That's what God calls that city that day. Jerusalem. He's going to call it Sodom and Egypt. Egypt. You know how God thinks about Egypt. And you know what he thinks about Sodom. That's, the, what the, the, that's how abominable and wicked it's going to be during the tribulation period when the Antichrist is ruling. And there's going to be Sodom and Egypt everywhere. It's going to be filled. He called the city that. Where, the, where also our Lord was crucified. So it tells you what city they're talking about. Verse 9. And they, and they of all of the people and kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They're going to leave them out there. And everybody's going to see it because media and the technology today, when John wrote, he didn't even know nothing about it. And you stream everything over the world. We stream it over the world right now. Look. They're, they're going to see their dead bodies. And they ain't going to bury them. They're going to let them sit out there because they hated what they preached. And the Bible said in verse 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice. They rejoicing over the fact these guys are dead and over them and make merry. When do you make merry? Merry Christmas? You know, we're talking about what's going on here. Look, and shall, shall send gifts one to another. When do you send gifts? What's he talking about here? He's talking about that is connecting a prophecy with Esther when Esther's made queen at the end of the seven years of his reign and that Jewish virgin's coming up and they're having a banquet for Esther and they're giving gifts. That's what's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. They're going to give gifts, but it's going to be because that these witnesses are dead that they hated it preached against them. Seeing gifts one to another because the two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. That's what people think about real preaching today is it torments people. And it ought to. It ought to what they preached ought to torment them. They live in like hell. And then you see the rapture take place. Back in Esther. So you see the prophecy. We're talking about prophecies. They're making gifts. They're giving gifts. The thing boils down to verse number seven. Esther's made queen. She's made queen. Let's stop right there. We'll finish it next week, and we'll go into the prophet. We'll finish these two. I got two more prophecies in this chapter. Then we'll go into the practical, and we'll see what God's given us. Amen. Study your book, man. Man, it's alive, ain't it? Great. It's amazing, man. That thing's wow. It's a book. It's more than just an ordinary book, ain't it? Amen. That's the words of Almighty God. And boy, get in that thing and study it, and read it, and apply it to your life. Amen. Let's keep one another in prayer. Don't forget uh, uh, the. Don't forget Mandy. Mandy's sick tonight. D'Angelo, of course, at school. She called and said she was sick. And they, uh, so pray for her. Uh, pray for one another. Pray for the service at the Hamlet House Friday at 7 o'clock. And then the young adults are going to the veterans with Brother James uh, in Fayetteville Saturday. Pray God will bless them up there as they try to minister to those veterans. Amen. And pray for our services coming up Sunday that God will meet with us. Invite somebody out to church Sunday. Invite somebody out to be with us when, uh, uh, what we say we called it? Wednesday with Esther, amen. Amen. Hope it's a blessing to you. If you got any questions, kind of throw them at me. If I need to recap over some stuff and go over some stuff, we will. We want to be too overbearing, but we do want to dig in the book and get what we can get out of it, man.